I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you here tonight for a very, very special members event. And for us here at the museum, let me say that the state of our oceans and waterways is absolutely paramount. We often think of museums as being fusty, dusty old places with old-fashioned objects. Well, they are that, but they're also about what happens tomorrow as well as today. And it's absolutely critical to the staff at the National Maritime Museum, and certainly to me, that we maintain a vigilant stance on the care of our oceans and indeed the health of what we leave behind us. We really need adventurers. What you do is to bring attention to these issues and what David has done particularly is just remarkable because we know that there are 13,000 pieces of plastic in every square kilometre of the world's oceans now uh, and it's a bit out of sight and out of mind but the adventure that David and his team have completed is only the first step. David is erudite, well informed and really has his head around the issues and I'm looking forward to working closely with him to see how we can make some real progress into establishing reform and new behaviour in relation to our environment. Well, it's great to be here at the Maritime right. Museum because this was the end of the journey for you with Plastiki, of course, sitting out there on the dock in all its splendour. Congratulations. Well done, mate. Well, it's... Um, really fantastic. <laughs> no, it's, uh, thanks. You know, it's... Um, it's one of those things that it's, the, I think, the greatest team effort ever. You know, there's an incredible team in this room right now. And, uh, you know, one of the learning curves for this project was no one's as smart as everybody. Um, and I think that's exactly what this project has summed up. At what point did you decide <laughs> you wanted to be an adventurer? Because for those who don't know, David has, this was, has been his really third big adventure, or fourth big adventure, actually, because you have um, walked to both poles. That's true. Adventure is, um, you know, it's, it's an amazing communicator. You know, for me, it was just about getting as far away and out there as possible. I've always felt more comfortable outside the window than inside the window. So, you know, it seemed, it seemed like a, a very good kind of uh, delivery mechanism for a message. The germ of the idea of the plastique, when did that really hit you? Where was um, it? You know, I just got back from, it was, got back from the North Pole and I was sitting there um, and, you know, we're talking about climate change. We're talking about an issue that, for the most part, sold to us through the lens of carbon and, and, and through the lens of, you know, energy. And two things that are very kind of untouchable and unattainable. And I wanted something that we could all feel and touch. And, you know, waste is one of those issues that no matter how, you know, good you might think you are or how good we try and be, we're all creating a footprint every single day. You know, we're all contributing to it, which means that we can all do something about it. And so I wanted something that was a little bit more physical. Um, and something that we could touch and feel and you see these issues, you see these human fingerprints and we all act so surprised and then we all get on with our everyday lives and we don't sort of actually stop to recognise that we can solve them and we just sort of announce it and then it, you know, and what's, you know, I'm really fortunate you guys are here today, it's awesome and tomorrow, you know, the message sort of dissipates and it goes and we've got to keep this momentum up. But with that comes an enormous responsibility to continue this work. This is a never-ending yeah, job never you ending. have now, isn't it? Yeah, and, and it's a, an amazing challenge and it's something that I relish, I guess, for me anyway. I think, you know, when I started, you know, informing myself about health and the environment and started reading and, you know, for the most part I found the, the, the green thing, which we've turned into a thing now, a little bit kind of exclusive and a little bit hard yeah. to get into and a little bit, you know, unattainable and a little bit worthy. And I just wanted to find information that would allow me to make an informed decision. Now, this guy had a big influence Huge. on you, didn't he? Yeah, this Buckminster Fuller. I mean, this guy is just a genius. He summed it up better than I ever could for what, what our project is about. You know, waste is fundamentally inefficient design. And so we've got an opportunity to create a design race, a design revolution, and we can start to design the solutions today. I was sitting on a panel. I was fortunate to be involved in a, in a discussion at the Google Zeitgeist a few years ago, and I was with um, um, an amazing architect, uh, called Michael Paulin, and he had designed the Eden Project. And one of the things that influenced me about him was his kind of, you know, his slant towards what are called biomimicry, nature-inspired design. And this whole idea that nature's got four and a half billion years of R&D, and that, you know, we can use that as an influence. And so that was the very early stages. And, you know, we, we looked at the pomegranate was one of the first stages of how the hull might be made up, um, how the, you know, a pomegranate, when you have it as a whole fruit, it's super tough. When you open it up, 
it's super like, uh, you know, the little seeds can, uh, are quite fragile. And I think these were some early sketches very early on um, that Michael Paulin had done. And you can see that, you know, packing the bottles together into these long trusses. And we created this little pond skater looking thing, which was going to be flown by a kite. And it was uh, um, this thing on the bottom right here. And, um, you know, we went through, I went down a farm and started introducing new materials. And there was two things, you know, another, two buckyisms. Um, you know, Mr. Fuller came up with two great things. One, he said, you find out what it is when you find out what it isn't. So we definitely found that out here where we were trying to strap together these bottles. Mm -hmm. And also another buckyism was, you know, do more with less. And I think these are two things that we can think about today. And, you know, do more with less. I think this message and the message that we're trying to convey here is like, we're not saying you have to stop doing what you're doing, but we can do it in a much smarter way if we just think about the design. Why did you choose PET? Um, it's a super cool, super strong, super lightweight material. I mean, it's, and it's so ubiquitous. You know, for me, I wanted to kind of look through a different lens. I didn't want it just to be about vilifying plastics. Mm -hmm. And I, what I wanted to do was say, you know, there are dumb plastics. You know, the everyday single-use plastics that are literally choking our planet and choking nature. And they've done exactly what they're meant to do, which is last forever. But we don't use them forever. We use them for, you know, 20 minutes, 15 minutes. You know, we use them for a very short period of time. We consume, we chuck. We got evil styrofoam cups. That's one of the main items. Plastic bags is another one. The PET bottles, that's another one. And the lids of the bottles. Those four main items, everyday items. Mm -hmm. We can actually cut those out. The plastic bags and styrofoam cups, we can cut them out today. If we find some politicians who can actually lead, you know, it might be quite exciting. So what most people can't understand when they look at Plastiki is about the construction of this remarkable 60 foot long Yeah, this is, in, this is in San Francisco. Um, all the bottles were straight out of waste management and were reclaimed. Um, we cleaned them, we re-energized them with a little bit of CO2 to give them some structural integrity. This was uh, testing the material, creating these, you know, we were doing this all from scratch and we wanted them visible and functional. And that's the point, is that 68% of our buoyancy comes from these bottles. They're not just aesthetic. They're not just something that we stuck on afterwards. We didn't know what we were up to, I guess, in the sense of, like, there was no benchmark. You know, we were just, we were, just, we were passionate and curious and innovating and, you know, tinkering and doing R&D in this shed in San Francisco. And, you know, th this incredible structure was just starting to come to life. And, and it was a huge, I think, undertaking for all of us to sort of sit there and explore and not be afraid to fail. So... The boat is built, this extraordinary craft, everyone's very sceptical and says no way is this going to get from San Francisco across the Pacific to Sydney. And that's really when the, the second part of the challenge began right with the sailing. You'd assembled this crack team, some of whom had never been on a boat before. <laughs> <laughs> One of the big things on our trip was we didn't see, you know, you know, you think the abundance of the ocean. 1947, Thor Hardo was like, you know, writing these, you know, these amazing you know, there's recounts of like fish landing on the deck and whale shark and flying fish and, you know, just this complete ocean that was alive. Um, but really, you know, it was very, very empty feeling and one of those tragic situations where you're looking out there and you're like, where is everyone, you know? Where have you all gone? And then you realise that we're waging a war on marine life, you know, and we're winning. Just Did you see much plastic in the ocean? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the big myth that we've tried to sort of tell people is that it's not a solid island and you're not going to float into it and hit it. It's actually subsurface. It's 61% is less than a millimetre in diameter. I mean, this stuff is really, uh, you know, tiny. And it's very, very hard to convey that message, I guess. You know, it's one of these things that, you know, for the most part, you know, it is an out of sight, out of mind. Type of, what, type of problem. Plastic's um, 100 years old, or 101 years old now. It was, it? Yeah, so when you consider every bit of plastic that's ever been produced is somewhere in our atmosphere, in our oceans, or you know, in landfill, you know, it doesn't disappear. You know, that is why we are literally seeing you know, plastic choking nature. And it's far more ominous. You know, what happens to plastic as it gets smaller is it becomes then part of the food system. It's living in the life layer of the ocean. It starts to get, you know, there's these little guys who are there just... <laughs> filter feeders, they're sucking up everything, the little salps and the arthropods, and that then is working its way up the food system. You know, this is a health issue. You're going to go eat fish, you're going to go eat meat. This is a health issue, and, you know, we have to start recognising that we are literally poisoning ourselves. We're at a time, at a tipping point, where we know that we are creating these human fingerprints. We know where the problems are starting, and they're starting with us, and to have that information and not do anything with it is just incredible to me, and I think we, we really can do something about it. And I'm, I'm definitely an optimist. I think there's people out there doing incredible things. 
We just need to support them. We need to create the framework, and I think we can do it. Joe is actually an environmental scientist as well. So apart from being an around the world sailor and has done a lot of sailing in Antarctic waters, how did you hear about Plastiki? I heard um, about Plastiki through the Royal Geographical Society. And I had spent, I had spent a lot of time on the oceans, um, but realised, and still keep on realising, that I know so little about the oceans. And that's what the plastic has continued to teach me. What was the best part of the voyage for you, Jo? Uh, the best part, probably, the fact that we did all build the boat together. Huge team of people with very little kind of experience, well, very little experience of building a boat that's going to cross the Pacific. And actually, we made it, and we proved that if you have many minds from many different disciplines and a lot of motivation and a huge amount of passion, that we're really powerful as human beings. Now, Andy. You must have thought, who are these crazy people when they phoned you up the first time, did you? Or, or have you had so many calls from crazies over the years? It's <laughs> it was pretty normal. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you respond when they said, we want to build a boat out of plastic bottles? It was a brief to get six people across the Pacific um, on a boat that was built from recycled or recyclable materials and that, would, that derived its flotation, um, its primary flotation from exposed external drink bottles, two litre drink bottles. So it was a pretty clear brief. And I knew right away that we were going to be dealing with materials that were going to be um, weak compared to what I'm used to working in. I thought, well, I better start looking at um, designs that were age old. So we, yeah. I went immediately to Polynesian voyaging catamaran designs. It's extraordinary. You must have felt pretty proud on Monday when Plastiki came in through the heads and you knew she was home and hosed finally. Yes. Probably about as, as proud as I've been as a naval architect, yeah. Well, I think Joe, Andy and David, you're all exceptional leaders in what you've achieved here. And thank you to yeah, the Maritime you. Museum for having us all here. Really appreciate it. And thank you for, for that. Thank you.